Hi everyone, uh, nice meeting you all and thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's panel, uh, which as you know, it's part of uh, the broader Global Health Tech Summit 2021 Festival Edition uh, brought to you by us, Gallingrove. Uh, today's topic, as I mentioned before, is remote patient monitoring, and uh, it has been considered as one of the key health tech categories, uh, both in terms of funding deploys, but also in terms of ventures booming uh, across the world and especially in uh, the APAC region. Uh, why it's important? Um, simply because it's one of those solutions that uh, puts together uh, and impacts patients first and foremost, pharma company, medical device companies, and hospitals as well. So it's quite um, a category that uh, cuts across the different uh, stakeholders of the healthcare system. Uh, today's panel is curated by the Singapore Technologies Consortium and uh, will be moderated by Gordon uh, Xiong, their manager and uh, um, uh, curator, let's say, of the partnerships between academia and uh, industries. Uh, Gordon, over to you and uh, enjoy the conversation. <laughs> okay, certainly. Uh, thanks, Anna and Galen Grove for inviting uh, Singapore Health Technologies Consortium to, to this panel and giving us the chance to moderate this panel. So, you know, we have very four exciting uh, young Singapore startups here with me. So I would just like to go through a quick uh, introduction of the startups there uh, and the panelists that, that will be on this session today. So uh, starting off, uh, we have uh, Dr. Mabel Nguyen, uh, co-founder and CEO of Allocare. And we have Dr. Rex Tan, co-founder and CTO of Avis Health. Uh, Mr. Abhishek Agrawal, co-founder and CEO of Connexis. And Mr. Jackie Cheng, founder and CEO of Upperman. All right, so I guess we are ready to start off the session, right? So as uh, what Anna has mentioned, right? So uh, this this title, actually this, this session's title is named Remote Healthcare Monitoring, Broadening Access to Care. I would like to invite all the panelists, you know, to give first uh, you know, a, a brief introduction of their startups and what uh, pain point exactly in the market are they addressing? Maybe we'll start off with Mabel first. Hi everyone, uh, great to be here. Thanks again for inviting me. And uh, my, I'm Mabel, a CEO and co-founder of Elocare. We are a Singapore-based startup founded early last year. Uh, and we have two co-founders, me and my co-founder, Fandi, who is our CTO. And at Elocare, we leverage on Internet of Medical Things, or IOMT, and AI infrastructure to build connected and smart healthcare devices for aging and chronic care. And currently, there are two specific um, products that we are developing. One is to build the IOMT solution to solve medication non-compliance, especially among the elderly with multiple chronic conditions. And another solution is to use a wearable tracker, or what we can call on-body um, IOMT, to assist in diagnosing and monitoring menopausal health for midlife women. And women's health, especially in the menopause, it is a very underserved area. The lack of technology solutions has led to a huge delay in diagnosis, ineffective treatment, and over a, a long term, higher long term disease risk for women. And uh, as a matter of fact, three out of four women don't get treated as they seek medi uh, medical care for menopausal health. And this is a gap that we are addressing. Okay, thanks, Mabel. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Rex to give an overview of ABS Health. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this conversation. Uh, my name is Rex and I'm CTO of Avis Health. Uh, Avis Health started, uh, really started in 2017. Uh, but however, what we, what we were doing were in the university labs for more than a decade. Uh, essentially, what we do is we build wearable stethoscope for remote patient monitoring. Uh, currently, we're focusing on chronic respiratory health, uh, addressing some diseases such as asthma and COPD. So why do we do that? Um, I don't know if you are, uh, I don't know if you are very aware of the chronic respiratory disease uh, space, but these diseases are very pervasive. They're very costly to, to treat and they can potentially be very deadly. So right as, right as of now, or at least where my data was valid, there are 
more than 545 million uh, sufferers around the world. And on average, each of them spend about 4,100 yearly uh, on, on treating and monitoring and managing those problems. Uh, even so, unfortunately, uh, despite all the effort, uh, every minute uh, it, there are about seven deaths related to chronic respiratory disease. Because there are a lot of challenges and gaps in the current management of chronic respiratory disease, um, many patients who are admitted to the hospital due to their exacerbation or the attack uh, are, are very likely to, there's a more than 20% likelihood of them to be admitting due to another attack. Um, be, between the time they're discharged and they're readmitted, it is a black hole. So nobody knows what's going on. I said the patient themselves, so doctors kind of have to rely on patient recount uh, and, and also some point uh, measurement um, that patient can provide to kind of guess, the best guess according to their profession, professional opinion to see what's going on. So the treatment titration process become extremely complicated. So what Avis Health is doing is we are, we, are, we are building wearable stethoscope that these patients can wear. Not only it can help monitor symptoms throughout, uh, you know, even pre-diagnosed to post-diagnosed, uh, at any time, any point of time where uh, symptoms of concern may arise, these monitors can potentially capture this event and give insight to not only the patient, but also their healthcare providers. Uh, we hope that this kind of technology will give, uh, will enable uh, healthcare uh, providers to better titrate the, uh, their treatment and give more uh, targeted care. And for patients to take power um, and to empower them to have the capability to know how their body is responding to how they are managing their disease and henceforth, um, on both parties of the healthcare provider end and also the patient to better manage their condition to uh, most importantly improve the quality of life of these sufferers. So that's uh, in a couple of minutes what Avis Health is doing and right now what we are striving to do. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rex. This is very interesting, right? I mean, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you know, COVID-19 has, has brought about <laughs> certain uh, opportunities for you as well, but maybe more on that later, right? So, so next, uh, we have uh, Abhishek to, to give an overview and to share what, you know, Connexis does. Right. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak uh, in this uh, uh, discussion, in this panel discussion. So, hello, everyone. I'm uh, uh, Abhishek from Connexis. Uh, I've been running this company full-time for four years, and uh, my background, uh, I'm an engineer by uh, education, and uh, I also have a degree in business. Uh, well, my company is, uh, first of all, what is my company? Kinexis is an AI-driven digital therapy platform and wearables company with a mission to enable and empower people for mobility and a better quality of life. Uh, that's basically uh, what we are set out to do. Now, uh, uh, you know, we are looking at musculoskeletal disorders and injuries, which is a global health phenomena. Currently, 25% of the global population is living with a musculoskeletal condition. And this could be either an acute or a chronic patient. And uh, we are basically uh, focusing on this. My main motivation behind, uh, you know, focusing on musculoskeletal patients is having seen my own father living with a spine problem for the last 25 years of my life. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do with this company is to uh, bring value and a pain-free, high quality of life uh, with, uh, you know, uh, for everybody who's living with a musculoskeletal condition. So that's basically the motivation behind uh, starting this company besides also building a business for myself. So, uh, uh, you know, the company has, has a medical device, uh, first product uh, called Kenya, which is already in the market right now, uh, being prescribed to patients who undergo, uh, acute patients primarily who undergo surgeries like total knee replacement and ACL surgeries. Um, you know, we, we have uh, been lucky during the COVID period to not just survive, but uh, actually uh, you report uh, one of the highest uh, sort of uh, you know financial uh, financially highest revenues uh, uh, in our existence so so uh, you know it's a testament to um, the need in the market that uh, uh, you know uh, need the, the, the demand and the need uh, for this kind of product uh, we are also coming with an exciting second product which is uh, uh, you know a sas play 
and it's also for musculoskeletal conditions uh, uh, for for chronic patients and uh, so that we cover the entire uh, sort of like segments so different segments within the whole uh, msk industry and uh, yeah i mean we are at an ex very exciting period of in the lifetime of this company wherein we are looking to grow uh, overseas uh, in overseas markets and uh, you know happy to share more and and discuss and learn from my peers here so so that's all about me and kinexus all right thanks abhishek i think this is yours is an example of how a uh, personal motivation you know has brought about you know in innovation and entrepreneurship right from your own ex uh, father's experience uh, you know experiencing a, a uh, you know, a uh, pain that that is currently unmet, and you brought about uh, you know your technology to to help to help you know patients in similar situations. So next, uh, we have uh Jackie. So from Upamed, uh, for him to share about what Upamed does. Hi, Jackie. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Gordon. Um, this is Jackie. I'm the founder and CEO of Upamed. And Upermed is a medtech company spin out from NUS, and we are working on a remote patient monitoring system for home dialysis patients. So in the current COVID-19 situation, we know uh, for those patients who have to frequently uh, get back and forth uh, to the hospital and conduct dialysis regularly every week, they have uh, bared much more uh, risk compared to other patients. Yeah, and especially as a statistic has also shown dialysis patients have 10 times more mortality and incidence rate than normal people. So this is a huge risk to these patients. And hence, every country, um, they are looking for a safe and a reliable solution to help patients conduct dialysis at home. So currently, the most uh, popular way to do dialysis at home is through peritoneal. It's called peritoneal dialysis. So we are focusing on peritoneal dialysis and try to provide a remote patient monitoring platform based on this. And another concern to these home dialysis patients, actually there are two concerns. One is about the compliance. Uh, doctors have no idea where the patient can die dialysis regularly. That's why they need a remote patient monitoring system. A second concern is the infection. So this is a major um, uh, unique selling point of our device because the current peritoneal dialysis machine don't provide such value. But we did, we have a patentable uh, optical sensor technology to help patients monitor their um, condition, their infection condition when patients are conducting the dialysis. So our system, our platform could help patients uh, have a same uh, quality of life care, care uh, quality uh, as they do dialysis at the clinic. And that's what we provide. So we're up from it. Thank you. I think it sounds like a very wonderful solution to, to have dialysis on the go, right? For patients doing any anywhere they want to. Okay, so so thanks for all the four startups for, for giving their brief introduction. So so we, we go to the first uh, open question, right, uh, of this session. So as as we heard, all the four startups have some form of uh, are doing some form of wearables or you know remote monitoring solution as, as part of their their yeah, as part of the solutions, right? Uh, remote monitoring component as part of the solutions. So this is also brought about by by the by COVID nineteen, no doubt. So I would like to invite uh, any of you to answer this question. Has do you think uh, remote monitoring, you know, has created uh, you know opportunities for startup in this region? Anyone would like to answer this question? Yeah, maybe I'll go first. Sure. Uh, I, I think uh, the rise of remote monitoring um, brought about, um, so in, in my understanding, it's not really the, the, the rise of remote monitoring, but uh, people are starting to see the need to, to monitor uh, outside of clinical setting uh, and to, to just better, better understand the individual's health condition. And I believe uh, this did not come about from the medical industry, but from consumer electronics, where people are more and more aware of the health because we have trackers to help try our health now. But this, this, this awareness and, and recognition of the importance being placed on knowing one's health and having enough data to, to I, I cannot now say always, but most of the time know how you are doing, become very powerful. As more and more people become aware, more and more attention are being driven towards uh, wearables and remote monitor in the medical field. And, and I find uh, this becoming a, a, a excellent opportunity for a, a similar like us for technology that has been a lab for a long time to see that now the time is right 
to, to, to build into something the, the market will be more readily accept. Because uh, I, I dare say 10 years ago, you could go to a hospital, go to a doctor and say, no, this is a wearable ECG. Uh, please use it uh, instead of a machine that, that you will have and so comfortable with. Uh, the resistance will be much higher back then than now. So I think this, this, this is a, a good opportunity for us and for startups like us. Uh, but of course, this has been accelerated uh, by COVID-19 because suddenly everybody wants to stay away from the medical facilities as much as possible, not just patients, including the healthcare providers, because the workload is just so much. And remote monitoring, wearable devices become an avenue, a tool for, for the whole entire industry to alleviate this condition. So I, I guess this, this is a, a brilliant opportunity and, and the time now is actually uh, just right for startup like us. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, anyone else want to share the points? Yeah, yeah, Mabel. Yeah, I was just want to follow up on that. That I one hundred percent agree. Although we are quite early, we just started this for like maybe nearly two years. But we see that uh, during this time, there's a lot of uh, government incentive uh, funding going over. It, as a matter of fact, we actually started the medication compliance solution because there's a challenge in the open healthcare innovation challenge, which is a collaboration between uh, ESG and also the national healthcare group and elder care centers in. Singapore, and they're actively looking for solutions to, to help with uh, how, how to deliver care remotely, how to make sure that um, the, uh, you know, like um, adoption of technology can be smoothly transit, uh, transit from the B2B to B2C to the community, to the, um, from hospital to the community. And these things, uh, last time it probably went take a long time. And like uh, what uh, Red say, maybe we approach uh, people and hospital, but they would uh, be hesitant, but now they're actually looking for solution and they come out with challenges so it's a good opportunity for startup to actually respond to them instead of even going out on your own and fight it mm -hmm. yeah certainly i think uh uh yes the the sort of the landscape has been has been changed also a bit now because of uh, what i think rex has mentioned also due to the uh, need uh, for for these devices by the consumers right so maybe before we, we get to that um Maybe I'd just like to hear views from uh, the other speakers, Abhishek and, and Jackie. Do you have any? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah probably I could uh, have some feedback uh, what I heard from, um, from the doctors. So um, when we try to expand um, like our product to other hospitals and we heard there's an uh, opportunity, like probably we could apply our uh, sensor technology is that um, we use our sensor technology to help uh, help those doctors to monitor their patient at home. Because the situation is uh, in most of the countries and in the future, more and more of the system, they will adopt the bundle payment. And this bundle payment won't specify how much time a patient could stay at the hospital. So hospitals have some flexibility to arrange that. And normally we know um, the bed seat is uh, almost the most expensive uh, expense for hospital. And if there's no, uh, no, no, no space, right, then they couldn't have more patients. Uh, so uh, this is, could be a, a very nice opportunity and especially in COVID-19 situation, a uh, patient don't want to go to hospital as well. So it become a win-win situation. Like hospital would like to earn more money and push patient back to their home. And they will try to find some um, service or technology to help them conduct um, this kind of monitoring and provide same uh, uh, care quality to patients so that they could charge uh, the same price or even more money from, from the patient. So I, I really foresee um, this kind of uh, trending is coming and especially from hospital side of view, they look very positive on this type of collaboration. Yeah, I, I think I, yeah, it's yeah. The, the part about decentralizing of uh, services uh, to home, like, you know, what generally what uh, all the founders here, you know, their solutions are about. So, uh, yeah, because of the big crunch in hospitals and you will prefer, you know, some, some diseases uh, to be managed, you know, outside the hospital, right? See, so that's why you have this home, home dialysis. But you mentioned one point about the doctors charging the same for, for the services, right? So the, the conventional wisdom is that actually, why, wouldn't you actually help to decrease the healthcare costs, you know, of this? Yeah. I mean, any of the panel uh, panelists can, can, can chip in. 
Uh, I, I, I do have some comment on this. Uh, as much as, um, uh, as we were all like, um, we, at least for me, I hope technology will lower healthcare costs. But however, uh, in terms of what we are paying for healthcare, uh, if we cannot do that, uh, but I do think it's still a good thing that we can reduce the amount of manpower uh, that is put into healthcare, but still deliver the same quality of healthcare uh, at the same price. So, so uh, an increase in quality is an increase in value to both the healthcare provider and the patient. Um, mm. I, I don't think we are at a stage whereby we, we, we can drastically reduce uh, healthcare cost burden at the moment with technologies yet. Uh, hopefully we are getting there, but, but I just want to say by increasing the, 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 uh, the, the quality of healthcare um, without increasing the price uh, at this point, current moment is, is a very good thing in my book at least. Mm, okay, I see. So, so it's the value that's increasing. Okay, so maybe doctors, they can charge the same, but <laughs> they bring on more values for the care. You know, some, it, maybe perhaps that's, that's how we might, we might go. Um, so Abhishek, any, any comments from you about uh, opportunities in the region? I mean, uh, you have an MBA, as you mentioned, so business-wise, I guess, you know, maybe what do you see, you know, for, for you know, this, this, this consumer-driven kind of technologies in, in healthcare? How can it, you know, change, you know, startups and solutions in the region? Right. So, uh, you know, uh, when we started the company, of course, there was no COVID and there was no uh, sort of like, uh, uh, you know, I would like to share that all these uh, wearable products and all these trackers and, and uh, software like medical software that, that technology and engineers were building was looked upon as a good to have, uh, you know, and uh, uh, COVID bought the realization that, you know, look, this kind of event can happen. And, and when this kind of event happens, then, then these are, this is like technology is actually the only way we can have still have some form of access and connectivity with the patient right so so that has uh, that that pull factor was missing up until uh, you know last year uh, when covid happened right so we've seen a huge what we call as a tailwind uh, to uh, adoption because of that and and uh, simply like i mean across all pretty much all uh, I mean, I come from a, so my segment is a segment which actually uh, reported a reduction in, in the number of patients because of COVID, because, uh, you know, uh, musculoskeletal surgeries or knee surgeries and sports surgeries happen to be uh, elective surgery. So patient can choose not to go for surgeries. So I'll just talk about my space, what happened there. So uh, we had a situation wherein patients cannot undergo surgeries anymore. Uh, cannot come to the hospitals. The surgeries have been stopped for, for almost a year last year. And, uh, and then we have started to build up a backlog of cases, right? So previously we had a two-year backlog. Now we have a four-year backlog. Uh, and, and then on the other hand, patients are, are sitting at their home and their conditions is getting worse because doctors don't want them to come to hospitals. Hospitals are not uh, doing elective surgeries. And you have this patients, uh, these patients are still experiencing pain and, and, and loss of function and, and are living a lower quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so uh, you know, this uh, also, uh, uh, you know, was a huge realization, right? Uh, that, that clinicians have like that this can, if this kind of event can actually happen. It's a black, black swan event and, and it, it really happened. And then, uh, um, uh, so, so for us really, you know, the number one opportunity was, was ensuring uh, like some, like the digital technology, whether you call it a wearable, whether you call it an app, whether you call it a, a SaaS platform or data platform, uh, it ensures that connectivity uh, between the clinicians and the patients. So our wearable device actually then became like sort of like uh, the, the, the thing that communicates or establishes the communication uh, between the clinician and the patient wherein things that the patients are not able to describe or tell, like, you know, what's my range of motion or what's my, uh, you know, cl clinical parameters related to my recovery. Uh, all of that are communicated, uh, collected and communicated by the device. So, so we had uh, pretty much, uh, you know, like uh, this kind of uh, sort of new paradigm emerging and uh, anything that basically reinforces and strengthens uh, the link between the, the healthcare provider and the patients 
and and does it in a way that that uh, uh, you know is is what we call as uh, the highly patient can high, can comply to easily like so so if you are selling a tracker then you know the patient must like wearing your tracker and the patient must uh, be able to use it by themselves without too much of a help uh, if you're talking about a app or a software then then you know patient must be able to uh, sort of like uh, understand and and use all the functionalities and like using uh, you know your your software or your app uh, again and again for that communication to to be maintained uh, in in a in a in a in a time where in human communication and human touch became almost impossible so so these are some of the themes broad themes around where i saw the maximum opportunities which we actually also uh, sort of realized and we worked around and fair enough uh, you know our device compliance uh, in the trials that we did over the last 12 months came out to be super high in terms of patients liking to use the device patient actually uh, you know understanding the data that is being uh, communicated to them and the surgeons actually being able to process and and intervene like design interventions remotely for the patients and 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 help them so 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 th that's where we saw the most opportunity over the last 18 months Right. Thanks. Thanks, Abhishek. So, so on that, actually, so can I say that uh, all four startup founders think that actually this trend is, although it is helped by COVID, right, but it will not stop, you know, when COVID goes away. So consumers are already used to this convenience, you know, of doing things at home and, you know, having part of their care management at home. They will continue to use, say, you know, your Connexus, uh, ACL, you know, movement, you know, your devices or peritoneal dialysis, uh, remote uh, portable dialysis machine, or, you know, Allocast, IOMT, or EVS Health, uh, remote monitoring respiratory solutions. Are you confident that consumers will continue to use them? I mean, in general, what, what also is the stage of adoption for such technologies, you know, now you feel? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, maybe, maybe I'll just, just go again. Uh, I, I, I think we are still very early, but uh, I'm fairly confident that you will continue on. Uh, because uh, if, if you see that there's one enabling factor of uh, bringing healthcare to the home, uh, which is telehealth. Um, uh, seeing a doctor, I mean, despite the fact that people can now very easily see doctor uh, without a sickness and still get a medical certificate to take leave, but, uh, but that, that adoption of tele, telehealth has shown the, the uh, willingness for patients and doctors, both sides, to move healthcare into homes. Mm. And if that movement is going to continue, that needs to be a lot of more innovation to support that kind of healthcare model. And, and so I, that's why I said we are still early. This is just a start. Um, uh, People are wearing Fitbit, Apple Watches to, to know that they're healthy. Just what, what can they do at a moment that uh, gives insight? This respiratory rate, uh, some heart rate, and maybe some sleep quality data. But even those are things that's very valuable now. We, we are getting used to it. And we are getting more and more used to uh, our medical condition being monitored as well. Uh, you know, outside of the hospital. So, so this is just a start. Uh, I'm very confident that we are going to uh, continue to write. Uh, this is I don't, I don't say I don't I don't I won't say sorry. I won't agree that this is tailwind of COVID, but we're going to write this wave. Uh, it might be a, a small wave at the beginning because we, we innovations are still not in abundance yet. Uh, but however, you, you will continue to go on, and this this will become at least in my opinion, uh, wearable devices, remote monitoring devices, the backbone of telehealth, which I trust will be the next model of uh, you know, healthcare delivery. Yeah, certainly. Uh, that's what we all hope for. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, 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 uh, it solves a lot of the issues that uh, not just, I guess in, in Singapore, it's not so, so much because I mean, we, we have got uh, hospitals, in vicinity, right? But for countries that, you know, uh, in some other countries, they might not have access to hospitals. 
within the next few hours, you know, and going to see the doctor at the clinic uh, takes a five hour drive, or five hour, maybe a long drive. So certainly I think some of these technologies can bring about by, brought about by decentralizing this care and services and technologies can, can certainly help in, in some ways. Right, any other uh, panelists would like to chime in with their opinions here on this? Um, yep, probably yeah. I could uh, share some feedback. So um, from our experience, we realized um, this kind of remote patient monitoring solution, uh, the main concern is not about whether doctors or patient would like to adopt, uh, if it's not paid by patient. So less, uh, uh, less assumption. In this case, uh, most of the cases were paid by the insurance company or paid by the hospital or uh, like government insurance. So I think the main challenge now is um, these uh, terms, these items are all new. There's no existing uh, code, product code. So although you like to do some self-payment business model and it's not available because traditional medical device we take is more like a treatment. You treat some disease. So it's called medical device. But most of the monitoring device is just monitoring. Yeah, so I, I think there will be a gap like from the uh, traditional definition of the medical device and the new uh, type of the medical device. And this is always the reason why uh, the system or the whole reimbursement uh, flow stop uh, the startups from keep going. Yeah, so I, I, I would take that as a first uh, challenge and the first priority if um, this kind of uh, device could really um, boom up, not just some type of the device yeah because from from what i see uh, most of the monitoring device they also encounter the same uh, same problem some of them successfully uh make an agreement with the insurance company especially those startup in in the united states and they really do very well but the same business model may not apply around the world so every country might have different issue and they will limit other startups from expanding the same business model to another market. So um, in the future, in the following five, five years, at least since I would say it might keep happening. And if we are lucky, we could see some changes in small uh, region, especially like the place like Singapore, um, they are willing to try new things. Yeah, the government would like to adopt a new technology. It might happen faster. But for those um, government who's very traditional, very conservational, then it might be very difficult to see uh, such achievement yeah, in, in these five years. Yeah, I think Jackie brought up a very good point here, and that is about the reimbursement the payment model of, of such services, right? So uh, in, in telehealth settings, that's less of an issue, right? You either have a subscription model or you, you have a pay for, you know, per service kind of model. You know, yes, but then how, yes, how do you, how, 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 firstly, there's a regulatory barrier, right? But we'll come to that later. Then uh, secondly, then after that, there's a payment. How do you reimburse? Uh, and yes, exactly. Governments have to be forward thinking enough, you know, to allow, uh, that to be reimbursed. So at this point, I also like to ask uh, Mabel. So for you mentioned uh, about your solutions in monitoring menopausal symptoms, am I right? So how how is that? Uh, how are you positioning this 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 technology? Is it uh, going to be a consumer health product uh, or a, you know something that you can work with doctors on? So yours is an interesting case. Yeah, so, so to be honest, this is a question that we actually are thinking about a lot. And because we are early for this product, we actually are conducting a lot of research in the R&D. So we have not yet reached the commercialization. And a lot of people also ask us about, so what is the best strategy? Do we um, become a consumer product for general health monitoring first and then work around the regulation later and become a medical device or the reverse, work on the regulation, make it a, a diagnosis tool and then slowly go out to consumers. So we still don't really have a perfect answer for this and because we also focus on the R&D for now, but uh, I think it really depends on where the market you want to go first. So for example, we've been advised that for example in Hong Kong, right, so regulation there is easier than Singapore, so um, it doesn't matter so much if you go to consumer or medical device, it's easier there, uh, but for other countries it might not be the same. 
And so I think that in terms of uh, in the earlier stage, for us, it's just nature for our background to work with the clinicians. So maybe it's better to, to be a B2B product, to work together with women and clinicians in the first stage, but we don't have to wait until the end to become a consumer product. If we work around the claims, make the claim really uh, reasonable, so we can also examine how to be a consumer product at the same time. Can we do that in a certain market uh, and, and go to market faster? But uh, in terms of both the background and where we are, we think that going to uh, the regulation first and become a, a medical device in the first state could be a better approach without background. Mm, okay, so your strategy is to, to go for the regulated product first mm. and, then, and then hit the consumer market. All right, yeah. so I guess investors will always ask you this question, right? <laughs> because they want to see you know, how, how can they you know, get the money out of it, right? <laughs> Whether it's the yeah. consumer or through the, you know, the, the regulated device road. So maybe related to this, right? I have a question for all the panelists here. So do you think this space, because some of you has actually mentioned Apple Watch and Fitbit, right? Do you think this space will be dominated by such consumer wearables in future or companies like yourself doing medical devices? Maybe uh, Abhishek would like to answer this? Or... Right. Uh, you know, regulation, I always think of regulation as a two, two, uh, two double-edged sword, right? Like, uh, it's like uh, one on one hand, you know, you are a, a regulated and approved product. You know, you are like, okay, you are some, you know, uh, you have some, uh, uh, you're looked at, at this different, differently in the market. And on the other hand, if you, tell investors that, look, I will need to get regulatory approval before uh, being able to sell, then it's like a turn off for them because you're like, oh, I, there's a barrier and then you know, it's going to take long and it's going to require clinical trial data and it's going to be expensive and gonna, uh, this company is not going to have any cash flows until their regulatory approvals are achieved. And so, so uh, I, I, it's kind of like dilemma, right, always. So uh, uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, sort of like paradigm, right? So, so for us, we are lucky, you know, we are like uh, uh, a class A uh, medical device product that, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of doesn't require us to do like extensive clinical trials and submit data before uh, the regulatory body approves us. So uh, there's no approval as such, you know, we need to still register our product with the regulatory body. And, and then after that, we can start selling. So we've been able to do that in Singapore and now we are looking at DGA and US FDA and CE marking uh, progressively. Uh, the other, uh, so, so uh, you know, my twist with uh, uh, regulatory uh, regulation hasn't been, hasn't been very like sort of uh, uh, extreme in the sense that I've seen other companies, you know, my fellow medical device entrepreneurs who've, who basically really felt stuck because their clinical trials couldn't proceed last year and they they couldn't like uh, get their product uh, uh, approved and and uh, it was definitely uh, a big deal for them so for us it wasn't a big deal we, we went on and we we achieved our regulatory and and we are continuing uh, to to file more regulatory uh, submissions and documents uh, in multiple countries now having said that uh, uh, for for in in times of covid we have also uh, just to share with my peers we have also uh, um, done some creative uh, uh, sort of like work around how do we sell our product uh, without regulatory approval uh, and and we have been able to uh, not just uh, convince doctors to put this on patients but actually charge them for it so so that means revenues so uh, uh, you know I mean I would say that uh, ahead of regulatory uh, uh, you know, R and R for regulatory and R for revenue. I would say focus on R for revenue more because R for regulatory may or you know it will depend on a number of factors and and it is outside of your control. Uh, especially in the private market, uh, clinicians really don't. I mean, it's it's kind of like for entrepreneurs and for founders and for startup founders, we're like, oh, people are not going to take our product if it is not regulatory approved. You know, I had the same phobia. You know, I call it phobia because uh, I was like under the impression that if I go to a uh, a doctor in Mount Elizabeth, you know, he's going to, the first thing he's going to ask me, is this HSA registered or not? And I'm going to tell him no, and he'll be telling me, get out, you know, but uh, honestly, uh, that didn't happen. You know, I, I went went to the a lot of doctors in Mount Elizabeth, and they asked me whether you can do a trial with my patient, and 
And I said, yes. And then they put it on the patient. The patient liked it. And they're like, fine, we're going to take the product and we're going to continue prescribing it to even more patients. And they, until today, uh, even after like uh, six months of them starting to use the product and putting it on number of patients, they've never asked me, you know, whether this product is regulatory approved or not. They never even bother. So, so you, you know, it's interesting, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, you can meet all kinds of people in all kinds of places, you know, and uh, some markets are good, good in this aspect that they allow you to, you know, like countries like India, for example, right? Nobody bothers, you know, if, if this product is useful and it's valuable, you know, I'll use it fine, you know, like I don't care, you know. Uh, and on the other hand, there are countries like Singapore, there are countries like, I mean, Singapore is still good, you know, I mean, I'm, we have, we have doctors here who, who, who will support you with regardless of regulatory. But yeah, we have countries like US and some European countries that, that they will never take your product on. The first thing they will ask before even you enter your and enter their country is, is uh, whether you have regulatory approval or not. And if not, then then talk to us when you have regulatory approval. So so it's 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 a double-edged sword. And then, you know, all, all, all I will say is that like uh, my fellow founders and entrepreneurs we need to be creative about uh, how we milk the market and uh, uh, do it uh, for our interest and not for the, uh, not just like uh, sort of like, you know, I mean, there is a, a, a proven path, like you get your product registered, regulatory approved, get to market, then start making revenues. But then there is this other path, which is like just sell it to whoever will take it and start making revenues. So I've like done both and, and, uh, um, primarily this route because of frustration, because this will take a long, longer time. And I don't want to wait until I start making money out of a product, which I've spent years developing. And, uh, and that's basically my two cents on this. Yeah, Abhishek, thanks for sharing. You, you also brought about a very interesting point or actually very critical point here about the differences in the culture, you know, for, you know, of course, doctors have always have the discretion to bring on the product without <laughs> regulatory approval. Right. But, but it doesn't help if, if the system is, like for some countries, doctors can be sued for every small little reason, right? So, 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 so I, I guess it, it, it plays uh, all, all, so the whole, the whole culture, the, the system, the, you know, the, of course, the regulatory system all plays a part in, in how willingness, you know, uh, patients and doctors are, are towards trying out, testing out new technologies. So I will come to that, uh, for you again later so but maybe just to round off this this questions discussion actually so for connexis and allo care there is a, a possibility to get the devices approved in the class as a class a device right but it might not be so much for for upper med on avis health all right because you're doing a, a, a peritoneal dialysis device and you're doing a respiratory device right so so in, in this Manner, do you see at least you know your, your kind of solution uh, disrupting the traditional monitoring devices or the traditional dialysis devices? Actually, for AV cell, there isn't such, such solution in the first place, right? <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. yes. Yeah. Um. Sure. So actually, um, this is actually a <clears throat> sorry. I would say it's exactly a challenging part we are facing. Um, if we like to conduct some first human trial. Um, on human right and there's more uh, process we have to do and this process is so complicated sometimes we even think about probably we should go for the uh, certification directly instead of passing this kind of uh, human trial uh, processing uh, very lengthy process yeah so okay back to the question in our case our device is class 2 device although this device won't contact with the body directly some of the RB uh, from the hospital will still ask for the uh, formal approval from the government uh, government entity like uh, in Singapore, it's HSA. Yeah, so it'll be much, much more difficult. And it's almost impossible for us to earn the money before we get any certification. Yeah, so another way we try to do, also we like to have some early revenue is we isolate part of our uh, infection monitoring uh, service into one sensor technology and try to um, have some revenue by selling the kind of uh, uh, service, like with our app, with our platform system. So this is the thing we are trying and we're also conducting the Kingo trial with the hospital. Yeah, to validate uh, the value of this kind of sensing technology. So in our case, uh, this, this is a problem we can't escape. But on the other hand, it also means the barrier is much higher. Yeah, so back to uh, our competitor, there's an existing remote patient monitoring service um, provided by uh, our 
competitor, or sometimes I won't say competitor because they might be our partner in the future. Um, what they do is a, a home-based peritoneal dialysis machine. And the, the gap we try to fix is about the uh, portability, the mobility. We know dialysis patients, when they start dialysis, um, very possible they will reduce the frequency of traveling because they have to do dialysis all the time. So in home dialysis, they have to change the dialysis four times per day. In hemodialysis, they have to come back hospital twice, uh, sorry, three times per week. So in each type of dialysis, it's always very um, limited. I mean, their, their schedule, their life is very uh, unflexible, uh, tied to certain uh, requirement. So we provide a portable um, machine, portable dialysis machine, allow them to not only could conduct dialysis at home, probably, but also um, in their uh, working space, at the office, or even at a car. So it makes the traveling the business trip become available to them, or they could bring this device to the airplane and go abroad. Although COVID-19 might, might not be available now. Yeah, but in the future, it will be very likely to, to, to become a truth, become one of the options. So what we do is that we provide them another option uh, with same value, uh, like um, our competitor, but also add on one more technology, it's a sensing technology to identify the infection at the early stage. Yeah, so there's a main difference. Right. I would like to add a point here. Uh, Jackie, of course, you know, I, I, I understand your situation and my comment about selling uh, was for people who do not have, who are not building devices that requires something as serious as dialysis, right? So definitely don't yeah. sell your product before you get your regulatory approval because it will cause you legal problems. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. You know, I didn't make myself clear before. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for yeah. my dear. Yeah. I want to add on, it's just like uh, following Abhishek and Jackie is uh, exactly like Abhishek say, should be creative about the business model. So everyone in the medical space think that uh, this is the, you know, the long game. You should uh, make sure that your product is properly um, regulated, properly uh, developed before it can commercialize. But it shows that even Jackie have a bit more impressive product. He can be creative about how to create revenue to sustain. So it's about how to be situational and combine the advice of both worlds and medical world that would have very different advice and the business world would have very different advice and how we combine to sustain as a business. So having a regulatory a regulate, regulatory approval and a very um, medical uh, product will create defensibility in the long run and be creative about the revenue can help you sustain in the short term so you can sustain your business. So this quite uh, something important to take in mind and something uh, I still want to learn and I learned a lot from the peers today, a lot for me to think about. Right, yeah, so since we are on this regulatory team, right, so maybe I have a question uh, for, for all of you, uh, maybe starting with Rex first. Uh, I suppose you're doing some form of uh, remote collection of data that, that could actually be used to submit for clinical trials, right? Do you have you encountered or do you anticipate any regulatory issues on that part? Because you are conducting, so uh, collecting data uh, at home, not in the clinical trial setting, right? Uh, yeah, so this is a very challenging question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I, I have two points of view for regulation and regulatory bodies. So on the business end, yes, yeah, sometimes it may seem like a hurdle, a hurdle or a barrier that you need to break through to, to, to cross. Uh, and then to achieve something. But uh, as a trained engineer, a researcher, uh, the, the regulatory bodies actually serve as a very good guideline uh, of what you need to consider. Uh, because regulatory guidelines, uh, even if you look at FDA, for example, they issue guidances, they didn't issue you rules. <laughs> so you follow guidances and uh, there are real human uh, behind FDA, uh, you know, trying to assess whether or not uh, uh, you follow the, the, the guidance and your consideration is sufficient for the device to be safe. So, so as, a, as an engineer, as a researcher, we take it as a fact. But unfortunately, there are areas that regulators are still lacking. They are, they are, they are lagging in, in regulating remote data collection, for example. They are, they are, they are, they are lagging in, in, um, at, in some sort of how to regulate AI-enabled softwares. Uh, so, so this become a very gray area. Um, 
of course, we, we, we understand HIPAA, we understand uh, patient data confidentiality, we understand how to analyze data, uh, all this very clearly, but how to do so in a system like ours uh, is still pretty great. So, so we, we, we just have to do to our best of our, our, our knowledge and the best that we can find out with multiple consultations with experts to, to find out a good way to do it. Uh, even so, uh, uh, we, we, we go on a very cautious approach uh, for our clinical studies. We, we still do a, a local based um, uh, study. So even though these devices could be brought home by patients, uh, their data it is, it, it is still protected with the same standard as it is that is uh, no way it's collected in the hospital. So it just very fortunately, technology has arisen enough, even including cloud technology, that we are able to implement all these securities, uh, uh, even for devices connected halfway around the globe. Uh, you, 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 can, you can have ABCHQ in Singapore and somewhere in the US using a device, and their data had never left that shore because we're using that particular cloud system. So, so all these are uh, technological aspect of things that we can try uh, to implement that, that, that will satisfy the current standard that the regulatory bodies are looking at and advising. But of course, uh, I, I might want to say whether this is right or this is wrong. We don't know. But so far, I, I think the regulatory bodies are accepting. Uh, I, I think the regulators are also on a learning journey on how, how, how to better manage these. Uh, I think one thing I would just say that a company like us would have to grow and learn together with them and be fast enough to react when they take action. So, so this is the approach that we're taking. I think one, one good thing about being in this uh, hazy field now, right, from the regulator's perspective, is also that you, you can also sort of, you know, help to guide the standards development in a way to your advantage. Am I right? <laughs> I mean, this is one yeah. strategy <laughs> that they to try to adopt. So, um, any other panel list uh, would like to add on to this? Okay, so if not, then maybe we will go to a, a so I think we are running a bit short on time. Uh, so we, we, we will go to, I, I, I will go ask each uh, specific questions to each, each company. Uh, so very quickly, maybe you can share with me, you know, some of your experiences in, while developing remote monitoring solutions in Singapore. Uh, maybe first for Abhishek, right? So you mentioned that uh, just now you were working with doctors uh, and patients who are very receptive, right? So, so can you share a bit more on how you work with them? Right. So our product is basically prescribed uh, after the surgery uh, by the orthopedic surgeon to the patient on whom he has conducted the surgery. And uh, device is used for up to three months period on each patient. And typically uh, what the doctor, uh, you know, like, so doctor does is basically he will conduct the surgery then we'll select a date for the device to be put on the patient and then he will inform us that uh, we have a patient uh, who's gone through the surgery at this date and then we will uh, basically uh, uh, deploy the device on the patient we'll train them on how to use it how to read the data how to um, you know uh, practice their at home routines that are prescribed by the doctor and the therapist and 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 how to track their recovery manage their recovery and, and out, after that, there are four or five uh, outpatient clinical visits uh, for the doctor. So each of these clinical visits, uh, we will publish a patient progress report for the doctor. And um, the doctor will basically use that data in the report to provide further guidance and information and if required, any intervention or medication to the patient. So, so that's basically how our device is prescribed and used. Hmm, okay, thank you. Um, for Mabel, uh, so you are developing some uh, IOMT solutions. Uh, one of it is in women's health, menopause tracking, you know, as you mentioned. So how can remote monitoring solutions in general you know, benefit women in managing their health? Uh, yeah, I think in general, women's health is a space that there are so many problems that are being addressed, not very effectively at all, or not even addressed. Um, so there are areas of uh, female's health that are still deemed as quite, you know, sensitive or taboo for women to openly talk about or even society to, to accept the conversations openly. And that's why I think remote health monitoring is very uh, kind of like appealing to women. Uh, imagine like, um, you know, like many women may feel a bit uh, hesitant to visit uh, the clinician or gynae multiple times or even visit them at all in the first place. But if you have some tool to assess their female health 
daily at home, very accessible, very uh, reliable, very, um, you know, like convenient. They are much more open to it. And COVID-19 has proved that many startups uh, starting in this space have gained a uh, uh, tremendous, uh, you know, like growth, despite a lot of hesitance from investors before that. But during the COVID, it proved that the demand for this has uh, taken out because well, actually, startup just go ahead and do it, and they got traction. Yeah. So uh, another thing is, you know, many biosignals in the woman's body they are tied closely to the female hormonal cycle monthly. So if you, uh, so that is very appealing for remote health monitoring because if you can monitor these uh, symptoms, uh, these are uh, female biosignals uh, on a monthly basis, it gives you a much more reliable data and more uh, useful for clinical decisions compared to just one shot in a clinical uh, um, measurement, measurement. And also if we look at the consumable uh, devices like Apple and Fitbit, a very basic function to check period, they only launched it very recently, despite it being a very basic function for women. So we see that it's generally quite slow to respond to women's needs. So, um, and another thing is many existing wearables and the tech solution that build the algorithm and the data is still biased toward male physiology and hence it doesn't work as effectively for female users. For example, females of uh, temperature and resting heartbeat, they fluctuate uh, monthly or when we experience a big hormonal change in our life, for example, puberty or menopause. So there is a real demand here for remote health monitoring and uh, yeah, for a better women's health management. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to see that uh, there are a lot of more investments coming into this area uh, during COVID, as you mentioned. Uh, because Is it because the investors suddenly realized that this is a space that is untapped on? Or well, was there any uh, resistance before that? You know, they didn't think that women's health would be such a uh, lucrative space for investment. Yeah, I think before the COVID, uh, people were actually putting a lot of attention to femtech and female's health already, uh, but they were still like attention but hesitant to invest because they're not sure whether it's really true. But because of the COVID and startup uh, went ahead and they gained traction and that kind of changed the perspective of investors that, oh, you can actually uh, gain the market. There's a market that's a real demand. And that's how the conversation around investment drastically changed over the last few months. And you can see a lot of attention into femtech. All right, okay, that's, that's great. Great for you, I think. Um, next, I would like to ask uh, Rex. Uh, so you have this uh, remote monitoring uh, solution for respiratory symptoms and you also can predict the onset of asthma using algorithms, right? So do you envisage uh, this technology to change asthma treatment? Because as I understand, there is no such predictive tool for, for asthma onset currently. Right. And nowadays, I mean, currently the treatment is more reactive, right? So you know that you have an asthma attack and uh, you, you administer your, you know, that uh, inhaler, the shot, and then, and then you go to the doctor. Right? So how do you see your, your device changing this? Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right that the treatments nowadays are, are more reactive. Uh, asthma is a type of chronic respiratory disease. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, chronic respiratory disease is a new disease that comes up just recently. Uh, it is so chronic that in the earliest modern medicine text, we can already find documentation of it. Uh, and all along, we generally treat symptoms um, as when it arises to suppress the, the, the condition. And, and also, we also take prevention in the form of a change of lifestyle of taking or, or taking constant medication. In the case of asthma, there are preventive medication that an asthmatic patient will take. So if you just talk about asthma, um, there are three ways uh, that I think uh, our, our, our way of delivering healthcare to recurrent respiratory disease are better because we are um, at this moment beginning to merge, uh, go in much into pre uh, prevent, uh, predictive. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we are beginning. But why predictive measure, um, while certainly is good, is definitely not as good as prevention. But let's not talk about prevention yet but it's way better than reactive measure. So I think I can list um, three points why, why predictive, uh, 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 predictive management of chronic respiratory disease, including asthma, will be better. The first is uh, we, we, being predictive, we prevent exacerbation. 
So an asthma attack can be pretty dangerous. In Singapore, it may not be the case because we, we do see a lot of uh, asthmatic children here in Singapore. And um, you, you seldom hear uh, you know, fatality due to the condition. There are, but uh, more seldom. But in different parts of the world, this is, isn't the case. So, so predictive, uh, uh, prevent, uh, predictive kind of management can reduce suffering uh, of patients, you know, because we can, we can uh, administer intervention at a much earlier time and, and most importantly can prevent uh, 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 mortality uh, when some of this death arising from these diseases should not, uh, should not happen. Not that, not that I'm saying that any death should happen, but I'm quite confident that uh, many of it uh, can be prevented when te if technology is more advanced. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I, I think our way would lower healthcare costs because if we are able to tell when a person is going to fall really, really sick, intervention can be taken earlier. And it is shown in multiple studies that when intervention is taken earlier, uh, the, the intervention is either in terms of medicine or simple, as simple as getting out of the environment that is triggering your asthma uh, is a lot more effective if it's earlier. And when, when it's effective, um, it, it, it prevents any um, you know, aggravation of the condition and it lowers cost that is that they will be incurred to you, uh, the sufferer, and also the healthcare system. So, and then uh, that will lead to my last point actually is to lower healthcare system burden, mm -hmm. uh, especially true in current uh, circumstances when our A and E are really taxed. We don't want uh, asthma or COPD exasperation patient going into in, into the A and E at this moment. So, predictive man, um, management of this condition can significantly, uh, I hope, and I, what we're trying to achieve, significantly lowers the risk of a, a such severe attacks and severe events that will result in, in, in extensive care in the healthcare setting and free up this uh, healthcare resources for, for, for other things. And uh, unfortunately, in, in current uh, circumstances, this, this healthcare resources uh, can be free up for, for fighting the, the COVID crisis that we are having right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for your case, right? So when you continuously collect symptoms or parameters from the patients, uh, is it the algorithm that, that sort of tells the patient that the asthma attack is coming, or is there someone at the back end monitoring this, you know, this data, you know, and then how, how does it <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so the intelligence is the system. So uh we, we the, the, there's an algorithm running uh on both the cloud end and also on the system itself to listen to your lungs and detect any abnormalities that arises. So uh, uh, for, for asthma attack uh, especially, so sometimes when, when, when there are symptoms presenting, you can still see a child running around and the next second uh, they're having an attack. But while they are running around, there could be uh, symptoms that there is already arises. It could be a little bit difficulty breathing. My co-founder uh, used to be quite a naughty child, I, I guess. So when he was young, he, he had asthma. And he sometimes will try to sleep off the asthma because at a very early, early stage, it was just slight discomfort. And, and because it coupled with the population of the patient, which is pediatric, sometimes this discomfort and this symptoms goes unnoticed. So we can, you can catch those uh, very early onset of an attack. Uh, that is not really predictive yet. But what we are, what, what, what we are going to do in, in the future is to observe the trend of how this person is reacting and how this uh, how, how this uh, um, symptoms are evolving and potentially uh, alert uh, caregivers or the patient themselves on a potential um, you know uh, attack coming up. So this is this is what uh, the, this is all done uh, on both the cloud side and on the device side. Oh, I see. Okay, interesting. So yeah, so it's so a bit tailored and personalized to each person's uh, symptoms or parameters that that will sort of yeah. tell, you know, that whether the attack is coming. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're working towards that, yes. Okay, thanks, Rex. Uh, so uh, the final question is to, to Jackie. So, so you have the PD machine, peritoneal dialysis portable device, as you mentioned, right? That can allow, you know, shifting away of the care from centers and hospital to anywhere on the go. So, you know, what are some of the challenges you face technological-wise or logistics-wise in developing such a portable dialysis machine? Um, 
Yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, um, technology part, we didn't encounter too much problem. The idea is straightforward and it's easy for doctors to, um, to understand what we would like to do, but more um, problems on how to uh, deploy the patient to conduct dialysis at home, actually it's more on health education. So normally for those dialysis patients, they are end-stage kidney failure patients, means their kidney has been uh, destroyed, almost lost their function, right? So for those patients, uh, some of them or most of them now are not uh, educated uh, completely, means they don't know there's another uh, choice to do dialysis at home. They don't have, uh, they, they are not aware of this option. So in the future, we won't only provide our peritoneal dialysis machine. We would like to also expand our market size, means we will spend quite some effort on education, on health education, try to help uh, nurses and doctors to educate these uh, patients when they are at the late stage of kidney failure, not, um, not rush in rush and go for dialysis directly, but have some time, have some buffer time to really think about what kind of dialysis modality is, uh, will fit uh, their lifestyle. So from the paper, from the lecture, and even in some countries, they have been pushed, we call end-stage uh, renal disease uh, care program, means they would like to do more uh, education on these patients. And the result has shown uh, for those patients with complete education, they have less complication, and also uh, the chance of home dialysis is higher, means if they are educated they have more willingness and confidence to conduct dialysis themselves at home. Mm -hmm. So this would be something we'll also focus as well because our end goal is try to help patients have same quality of life at home, not just provide a dialysis machine for home usage only. Yeah, okay. So I guess the patient education is, is, is important for them to, to be accepting of your device. Right. So does remote monitoring come in in any way uh, for you? Um, do you mon collect data from them? Um, yeah, so far we, we, we tend to uh, implement this kind of remote patient monitoring, but it depends on um, the adoption of the hospital. So we split into two parts. The first part is we we'll only uh, conduct the local data storage and uh, use the app for patient to uh, track their health condition every day. Yeah, but in the next step, definitely we could extract this data uh, from a patient's app or we sync to a cloud and conduct the real remote patient monitoring service. And this is actually uh, the a competitor has conducted. So we will work on that as well. This is the value we try to bring to patients and doctors. Okay, thanks, Jackie. So I think uh, we have heard from all the four startups and we had a, quite a fruitful discussion on, on remote monitoring and how it, it sort of broadens the patient access you know, to healthcare. So uh, before we end off, so I would like to invite each, each panelist or each founder to, you know, to describe in one sentence, how is your startup going to change healthcare? <laughs> we can run off with uh, uh, Mabel. Oh, I wish it. Okay, sure. Right, so uh, I always say that, you know, Kinexus is an AI driven digital therapy platform and wearables company with a mission to enable and empower people for mobility and a better quality of life. And I need to run because I have a patient waiting. I need to enable and empower him for mobility and a better quality of life. So, okay. Uh, connect with all of you. Thank you very much for this time. And uh, I really need to run for my patient. Okay. okay thanks. Thanks, Abhishek, for joining. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, for the rest of the founders. Uh, yes, for us, um, again, uh, to wrap up, I would just want to emphasize that our mission is to use IOMP and AI technology. Uh, with technology enable uh, healthcare to help people live longer and age gratefully. That is our mission. Okay. Uh, Rex? Uh, so here in Davis, uh, we believe that technology allows patients to gain control over their chronic respiratory conditions by empowering both the patients and their healthcare providers with uh, actionable insights that they can start to elevate the uh, quality of life of this patient. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our purpose is working on the technology which could improve Dalit patients' quality of life. And especially in the future, we hope everyone could choose the most appropriate uh, Dalit modality for them. Okay. 
Yeah, so many quality of life is important for all the patients. Okay, so I think we have come to the end of this uh, panel. Thank you for uh, joining us and thank you for you know all the panelists on, on board here. We'll see you again. Thank you. Uh, and I'll thank you. Thank Thank you, thank you so much. It was indeed a very interesting conversation. And as an audience, I, I, uh, I really enjoyed it. You actually, I mean, I mean congrats to Gordon for uh, also some challenging questions. So very thought, uh, very uh, thought, thought well, but also uh, uh, the panelists that uh, were also quite open in sharing their, their experience with, uh, with the adventure. So, all the best to you all and uh, you know good luck with your uh, future uh, endeavors and uh, hopefully you can scale and reach those uh, the patient outcome that uh, you are um, aiming at solving but also in terms of uh, business because uh, that's also part of uh, what we're doing here right so uh, again thank you so much